Welcome back. Our final session, we have Let's Get Digital, the role of crypto in investing. Our guests are Justin Paternal, CEO and co-founder of Card Shop, and Dr. Phil Perriman, Chief Behavior Behavioral Officer of Osprey Fund. And heading up our final discussion today is Lule Demise, President of Ally Invest. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, hello. Thanks for, for coming and joining us, Phil and, Do and uh, Justin. And, and uh, thanks again, Brian, for the handoff. I hope you guys didn't miss that fascinating uh, fundamentals versus technical debate that Brian was just having, which is definitely worth a watch if you've not seen it for the replay. So today I'm excited to be literally just a fly on the wall with two smart individuals that are here really to educate us on cryptocurrency, digital currencies at large, um, as well as other digital assets that I know are part of our, our cultural and social media vernacular now. Um, and, and we are not doing this because we're advocating investments in these or not, but as uh, an investment provider, an investment vehicles and investment platform provider, we think it's our duty to make people understand context and what's happening in innovation. And whatever you may feel about the valuation of digital currencies or not, the reality is digital currency and its underlying technology, blockchain, is disruptive. And there's a lot to learn from it in terms of what it'll do to our uh, both our investment outlook in the future and our society at large. So I'm going to probe from that angle, that, that intellectual curiosity that I have as a novice in understanding from Phil and Justin. Welcome, uh, Phil and Justin, to our conversation. You want to just give a quick introduction of who you are, and then we'll kick it off into an interesting Q&A. Yeah, sure. I'll start. Um, Justin Paterno, um, CEO, um, co-founder of Card Shop. Um, we're, we're a startup in the crypto and NFT space working on an early product that's in stealth mode right now. For that, I worked with Phil actually at StockTwits, the largest um, social network for investors and traders. So I've seen the rise of you know, Web2 and investing communities um, you know, around retail investors for the last 10, 11 years, and I very much see the same thing happening in crypto right now. Fantastic. Phil, you are muted, Phil. That was the first mute of the, uh, the first accidental mute of the hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really, really honored. Um, thanks, Luli. Uh, so I'm the chief behavior officer at Osprey Funds. Uh, we are a, a, a digital asset uh, investment firm, and uh, we focus on uh, creating uh, products for investors in this in this area. Um, I do a lot of uh, writing and research in this area. Uh, it's an incredible uh, dynamic field at this moment. So much happening so fast makes it a lot of fun for me. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And, you know, I asked Phil, the last time we spoke to him, he had that beautiful background. And I thought it was actually a backdrop. And that is a beautiful tree in his backyard. So it's going to be nice to see that gorgeous tree and sunlight behind you as well as we speak. So thank you again for joining us. Um, so let's get started. So the one ask I have of you, both of you gentlemen, is that we have highly smart viewers, but we need to keep the language accessible and 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 the conceptual kind of description accessible. So let's, let's make sure that this becomes not a, an expert's conversation, but one that opens up the theme of this area. So with that, I'm going to ask you first, Phil, can you explain for our viewing audience, what's blockchain? And what, how does it relate to digital currency or other kinds of technology? Well, let me just say right off the bat that this idea that communicating in a clear fashion. Uh, that is such an important thing. So I'm so glad right out of the gate that you're saying that because really a, a lot of the terminology and a lot of the sort of deeper aspects of the technology and what's happening in the space is understood by only a very few people, mm -hmm. only a very small group of people. Blockchain is really just a ledger. It's just a spreadsheet. I mean, it's Excel, really. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but it really is just a spreadsheet. But instead of that spreadsheet being owned by any one person, it is distributed across a network of many, many computers. And so there's no one entity 
one organization, whether it's corporate or government, that is controlling it. And so that is the decentral. That's when people use the term decentralized. That's what it means. And when you have no one entity controlling it, there's no one entity that can change the rules or make it unfair for their own side. And so that's really a, a quick definition of blockchain and also sort of one of the profound potential value propositions of this new technology. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, the idea of a ledger or a spreadsheet that is embedded in my transaction as unique is a little meta. So now let's let's connect now this idea that you just explained to us. How does that connect to a digital currency like crypto? Well, the term cryptocurrency, you know, back in the 90s, we used to use the term cyberspace to mean the internet. And we don't hear that anymore. That was the dominant term at one point. Oh, that's happening in cyberspace. Oh, it's so fancy. But now we don't really use that. We just use internet. It's just a lot easier of a term. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because cyberspace was not a great term. The implications of it and were not the right implications. And we didn't, nobody understood it well enough. And so when we use the term cryptocurrency, that also, I think, is an early term that will be replaced eventually because what we have with blockchain technology is a lot more. Yes, there is a, a, a lot more functionality. Yes, there is a currency aspect to it. But yes, there's also a software aspect to it. Yes, there's a ledger aspect to it. Yes, there's an ownership and token aspect to it. Yes, it's a speculative asset. Yes, it's a commodity. Yes, it's software. So it's, it's, it's many, many different things and multifaceted. And I think that the term cryptocurrency will either go by the wayside eventually, or it will be used more accurately and narrowly to describe uh, decentralized technology for money. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things, the reasons I always tell people that they have to remain intellectually curious about this technology, this blockchain, because of the multifaceted ways it could disrupt so many things beyond just digital currencies. So thank you for breaking that down. So, Justin, let's bring you into this conversation just again to level set on definitional elements. Tell us what are NFTs and how are they related to blockchain? And what's so your NFTs, so NFTs are related to the blockchain technology because the blockchain is all about digital ownership. So, um, you know, piggybacking on Phil's point in um, your earlier question, like when you think about Bitcoin in terms like Bitcoin is this coin that, you know, lives digitally that I can send to you. Unlike a copy um, of a file or a copy of data, it is actually data that lives in your possession. And, and that's a revolutionary thing about blockchain technology. Um, so thinking about a Bitcoin or a token that lives in your computer that I can send to someone else and now it's no longer there or lives in this computer um, where I can change the ownership of that of that token um, is central to all of crypto. And with NFTs, basically, um, it just means they're non-fungible. So unlike Bitcoin or um, Ethereum, where I can trade one thing for another. So, you know, a good thing that would be fungible is like a share of stock. Um, or or any currency that you know they're all kind of the same. An NFT is um, unique, so I can't trade this one for another one. Um, so it's it does really well, and you know where you're seeing the breakthroughs right now is in the collectibles market. So an NFT is the token that you hold, this digital asset that represents you know whether it be a piece of art or um, with Top Shot, it's a um, you know the equivalent of a basketball card. Um, but, you know, when you look out into the world, most things are, you know, most things you buy with currency are non-fungible in, in and of themselves. So a lot of people are really excited that, you know, it, pro it provides this idea of digital ownership of things, things money can buy. And I think that's really what's got everyone excited. Got it. So it's, oh, it's got its own NDA. If you, it's, got, it's got its own DNA, if you will, in terms of the, the composition of what represents that image. So Let's 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 get, let's get into a little bit of social culture right now, right? So my Twitter feed is full of people that are, you know, have uh, art and memes that are being delivered through this NFT. What what's with what's with the hype? Like, what why is such a such a hype? And why are willing 
people willing to pay for that? Yeah, so I think with memes and art, the hype's around the idea that they are very easily replaced with cryptocurrencies because, you know, a lot of the value in art and memes, it it, it isn't tangible to begin with, right? Um, you know, like art is very much, you know, a market where people, you know, people, it's the ultimate, like, uh, Keynesian beauty contest, you know, and, you know, some of the problems with the art market and the, the traditional collectibles market is the concept of provenance. Um, you know, where did this piece of art, is it real? Who owned it first? You know, what's the chain of ownership here? Um, and blockchain being open allows people to see, oh, this person minted this piece of art. Um, and now it's changed hands all the way to me. And here's the prices that it was paid along the way. Um, and, you know, the collectible space, I think one of the big things with Top Shot was the ability to digitize the entire experience. Um, you know, it used to be people collecting um, baseball cards and basketball cards on their own. And, you know, I think cards topped out in the 90s. And a lot of people thought it was because like this big bubble in, you know, cards. And that's when Beanie Babies were big. But it's really the Internet came out and kids had other things to do. Right. We, you know, I was growing up then we played, you know, more more video games. We went on the Internet. Um, and now with Top Shot, you have all these people creating all this data, all these services on top of the collectibles uh, market. So, you know, where I'm seeing the market go over the next, you know, 10 years is, um, you know, retail ownership of these cultural assets. You know, it's an entirely new asset class in and of itself. Yeah. I think when you said with baseball cards, something went ding in my head in terms of, oh, I see. That's sort of the unique valuation that we put on things that are precious to us, not because it produces anything, but because, as you call it, is a unique Keynesian beauty contest. I'm going to try that on my brother, who's an artist, and see if he <laughs> that term, but love that term. So now that we've sort of level set on the foundational elements of blockchain, digital currencies like cryptocurrency, as for what, for lack of a better future word for it, and NFT, I'm going to ask you to give me examples, tangible examples. You've started doing that a little bit, but I'll start with Phil. Give me what you think are the top use cases for blockchain technology? Well, I'll tell you something, just to piggyback on what Justin was saying. We're just beginning. This is one of the things that, two of the things that makes NFT so exciting. One is we're just beginning to see applications of these technologies that have uses in the real world. And one of them that is easier to grasp is ownership. And also, so that's very exciting. It's like, wow, we've had this great technology. Everybody's excited about it. What are we going to do with it? Oh, I see. Now we're going to be able to do something with it. Really cool. In addition to that, it's an added bonus that we're talking about visual because humans love visual. Uh, we love art. We love watching a great slam dunk. We love all kinds of incredible things. You know, we love looking at the Grand Canyon. We love to be stimulated visually. And so you put those two things together. It's an early application and there is a wonderful creative visual component and you just get something so powerful. And I'm so sorry. I was thinking about that last question. I forgot what you asked me. So you can, you know what, I'm going to spread this love around a little. So I'm going to ask you for one more use case that you think blockchain technology is going to be applicable to. And I'm going to ask the same thing of Justin, what he thinks of another use case. Top okay, use so case, I, like top example of how this technology is going to be applicable. Yeah, well, I, I think as far as NFTs go, I, I think what's really exciting is the ones that you, you don't necessarily want to speculate in but they help, um, you know, make a market. Um, a good example would be something like a, like an Uber driver, right? Like when you think about a tokenized representation of that, like when you open up your phone and you look to see what drivers are available, think about an Uber driver, you know, sitting in kind of space on your map, you know, that car, that driver, you know, can be tokenized in some way and you could build applications, you know, a million different Uber and Lyft front ends, you know, you have the one, directory of listings, right? Like the blockchain. And now you have all these front end decentralized applications, kind of like you see with Expedia or, um, you know, all these places that do the same thing with um, flights and hotels, um, you know, bidding on that ride for you, the user. 
Um, so, you know, when you look at the economics of Web 2, you see, you know, these big behemoth companies like an Uber or Lyft um, kind of putting a moat around that driver. Whereas, you know, in Web 3, we see the driver itself is the scarcity that everyone's bidding on. Um, What's Web I think, 3, Justin? Tell, tell us what Web 3 is. Oh, so Web 3 is just um, the idea of blockchain technology, um, you know, applied to the web. If Web 2 is about um, the social web, where, you know, it, it was about, you know, social networks and networks of people, you know, Web 3 is about, um, you know, digital ownership, blockchain technology, and, um, you know, really kind of people say the Internet of money. Um, I, I would say, you know, it's probably something closer to the money in the Internet, but, um, you know, you, you start to tokenize um, digital assets. And, you know, it's almost, to me at least, it's like a market in everything. Yeah. So, Phil, did you want to take a bite at this or should, should I? To that, to that point, and also to answer your original question, um, it's really exciting what's happening now in business in terms of us being able to uh, access services all over the globe without boundaries, without w w without any boundaries, um, based on other technologies as well, but with um, uh, digital assets interacting with those other technologies. So I can hire a designer in Brussels or wherever very easily, and I can pay them in a currency directly with no intermediary and no uh, currency issue whatsoever um, because I'm paying with a global currency, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. Yeah. So throughout this um, COVID um, sort of, you know, um, pandemic sort of reality that has accelerated so much of the digital sort of nativity of people, um, one of the things we all learned is about um, how there were so many supply chain disruptions, right? Like how you know, toilet paper was more efficient in the corporate market than it was getting it at the grocery store, right? Um, we even saw that supply chain disruption, if you recall, with that big ship that was stuck in the canal, in the Suez Canal, right? Like, and we saw, oh my God, like three to, you know, billions of dollars of supply chain disruption. How do you see this technology, if at all, um, impacting the way the supply chain works, which is so much of our blood you know, sort of the, the streaming, the bloodstream of our economy. Um, oh. Go ahead. You have to go. <laughs> um, as far as the supply chain goes, I think actually there's some really interesting um, applications. Um, you know, Ethereum is built on top of, you know, what, what are called smart contracts. And smart contracts are really interesting because, you know, it's code that sits on the blockchain that will always execute the way it's written to execute. Um, and a lot of people, um, you know, so a lot of people think that this will eventually, you know, not only is it code and says like, if this, then that, um, you know, it is law, right? So you start to take, um, rules and laws and put them on the blockchain. So when you think about, um, you know, the supply chain, think about concepts like drones and robotics, um, executing code with business use cases on top of it. So it's like, I can buy this contract for this thing to go here. Um, and you know, if I buy that, it executes there. So I think what we're going to see is, you know, the idea of these these contracts executing autonomously and potentially being composable where I can have one portion of a, a supply chain owned by, you know, th one entity and another one owned by another entity. Yeah. And that interoperability, it cuts out the middleman. That's a huge piece here in terms of, uh, efficiency that will be added to the system. There will be, it, it, it will be direct. There, there'll be less need for mi middlemen. And the only other thing that I want to add to that is that this is going to take a while. And there still is the real world. There still are shortages of specific uh, materials and resources. So we're going to always have uh, the real world to have to interact with and the shortcomings of that. But we'll uh, 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 will there be, you know, as Justin points out, profound efficiencies added uh, to the system based on our ability to go direct and interop and uh, interoperate 
Uh, absolutely. So let's pull time in a little then, if that's the case. So let's not go too far out in terms of all the possibilities, but rather the immediate things that are happening today, right? So I'm going to bring us back to um, cryptocurrency and what we have seen in the pandemic, the engagement around it for speculative or other reasons, um, and how we have seen it, you know, go to its not, it hasn't hit its lows, but decline significantly from its peaks and yo-yoing back and forth and people's perception that that is um, the beginning and the end of the technological revolution. So give us context about that now that we are looking, orienting ourselves to now and what this technology means to now. Why don't you take a, a, a Phil, why don't you take us a, a crack? Well, so you're seeing, so we talked about NFTs and that really is a, 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 a ownership. Um, and there is, you know, potentially uh, uh, legal and con contractual uh, opportunities there. We're seeing that happen right now. We are also seeing um, uh, digital assets as a store of value with similar properties to gold um, and some advantages to gold as well. Um, that is also early in the adoption curve, but happening as we speak and has been. It's probably the first one probably the first application in the original application. We're also seeing the development of digital currencies happening right now um, on uh, blockchain technology. And we're seeing countries, uh, uh, China is particularly far along there. Um, the US is working on it. Israel just came out with an announcement today that they're testing it built on ETH. Um, and uh, we're going to, so we're going to see that we're going to see centralized digital currencies. So not decentralized currencies, but digital currencies that are national mm -hmm. um, developed on this technology. Um, those so, are, so let me, can I bump in into that? So mm -hmm. the whole point was that this was also decentralized, right? So tell us in a world where, you know, as they call digital currencies that are, you know, that are, commissioned by a nation state fiat, right? In a world where you have digital currency that's a dollar, digital currency that's whatever the yen, how does that work in the ecosystem of a decentralized digital currency world? Well, if you think of, uh, if you think of Ethereum or Bitcoin or other technologies as just a technology, and that anything that, as a, 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 and, and that anything can be built on top of that, the way you built on top of technologies, um, then that's, you know, so a digital dollar could be built on top of a decentralized uh, technology or uh, the Israeli, uh, uh, current, the Israeli shekel or any other currency could be. Now, in China's case, they won't. That will be decentralized from the top to the bottom, from, from the protocol level, platform, the, the, the currency itself. But they are a, a, a nation that keeps uh, a lot of control over um, everything that they do at, at scale. So they're going to be they're going to be building that in house, so to speak. So beyond the the technology elements of it, maybe Justin, you can help us understand this as well. When you have a, you know the digital dollar, the digital pound, whatever the case may be, does then Bitcoin and you know all the other coins that are decentralized. Do they do they become irrelevant, or how how does that work? Do they just become the technology and not the currency? Yeah, I think a lot, and up to now, and really pretty much only up till recently, you've seen it kind of be a us versus them mentality in crypto. Um, and you know most networks kind of form like that. You know, I know when we we started stock twits, it was like us versus CNBC, and eventually you start to become the institution. I think. You know, I see a world where you have your sovereign currencies, whether they're digital or not and programmable or not, um, built on Ethereum or built on their own blockchain or built as a layer two, you know, on Ethereum. Um, you know, I don't think it'll be relevant um, in the long term, but you're going to have your centralized sovereign currencies. And Ethereum is kind of like a global settlement layer. Um, so, you know, cryptocurrencies do a really great job at making things trustless so that you can interact with this network and this system and not have to trust that, you know, your money's going to, you know, 
get lost or like with smart contracts, you know, it's going to work the way, you know, it said it was supposed to work. So, um, you know, when you think about the interaction between, you know, sovereign currencies, um, potentially other, you know, non-tokenized capital markets and other sovereign currencies, you will have, you know, I could see Ethereum being this um, or whatever chain, you know, or many chains likely um, being this global settlement layer um, for, and it, it means the tech, it means, you know, the value of the underlying cryptocurrency. Um, it's all somewhat intertwined. Does, does that make sense? It does. So it's an and story and not necessarily an or story. Very much an end story. Yeah. So I'm sure you've got relatives that constantly pepper you with questions of like, oh my God, you know, should I buy crypto? It used to be so high. Now it's low. Is this the right? How do you educate them beyond the speculative moment that they're having a conversation with you about so that you don't necessarily put them off of this amazing revolution so they can stay curious, but at the same time, you don't, you know, satisfy a, a, a quick itch, if you will, on something that could make them lose their shirt. Pretend you're talking to one of your relatives or your friends that's at a, at a, at a party that's asking you this, like, is this, is it time to buy? Is it time to sell? What should I do? And you don't have to be giving us financial advice here. Think of it as education. Relatives and friends and people that I see uh, from the neighborhood at my kids' lacrosse games um, are usually focusing on speculation. And so a really good way uh, from th that works for me to think about it um, is to separate the speculation from the technology. So we are talking about these, this very new technology. The only real comparison is the early, the, it, that comes to mind is the early days of the internet um, that Justin brought up before. It was a perfect example, and I used it for the cyberspace example. The early, day, the early days of the internet, there was this incredible technological breakthrough of networking uh, us all together um, you know, through these pipes, right. And, uh, you know, these electronic pipes and, um, that is the technology. So there's that technology. And then there's the speculation, which is a lot of fun for people who want to take risk in one way or the other, whether they want to invest for a longer period of time or whether they want to gamble, uh, over shorter periods of time. So I would recommend that the the important thing to look at, um, and and it's sort of like that quote, you know, in the short term, uh, the market is a voting machine, and the long term, it's a weighing machine. I would say that uh, the real way to look at it is to think about the technology and to learn. You really want to be a good investor in this area. You do. There, there's no easy answer. You have to learn. You have to learn a little bit about the technology. You have to learn to differentiate and to try to figure out where this is going and what might have legs and what might not. Yeah, that, that's great. That's wise counsel. Now, you both also come from sort of the, the background of understanding the intersection of social media and finance and fintech in general, right? How Teach us a little bit about how these new digital assets and this technology at large and social media interact. Justin, why don't you give us Yeah, that? so uh, I think it's, you know, very much the, you know, the next generation of, you know, what we did at StockTwits, um, where we we built everyone really their own trading floor, um, you know, and, and it still exists today's so largest social um, network for investors and traders. Um, whereas, you know, now it's starting to be, you know, each project in crypto, um, you know, has their own community. And when people start to value, and it's really something that gets... Um, discussed as you value a project, it's, you know, how many wallets, you know, do we have? How decentralized are we? How active is our community in our discord? Um, because really the only scarcity when you really think about it and when you want to think about this last year was, um, you know, aside from like natural resources, which potentially, you know, we technology can fix some of those problems is time. Like we only have so much time and you only have so much time in the day. So if you have enough people to spend enough time around a particular project or um, whether it be a currency, even if it's an art project, that generally is good for the valuation. So, 
you know, basically communities, everything in crypto, um, you know, and it will, you know, the community will take that technology as far um, as the technology can go. Yeah. And in terms of um, you just mentioned it earlier, if you could just touch on it a little bit on the energy use, right? You hear it in the headlines constantly about the tremendous use of energy that this technology has. Um, and it's interesting because when you're comparing one thing with something that's not apples to apples, it's all, you know, that always can get skewed, but give us, give us a sense of energy use, how it compares, let's say to like the dollar, right? A digital currency versus a dollar. Um, the, the debate around the use of energy for these technologies and then where you see that going in the, in the next few years. And Phil, why don't you start us off? Well, I think over the longer term, you're going to see uh, the evolution of blockchain technology spur more uh, assertive green technology. And the example is the uh, president of El Salvador. Um, looking into exploring the use of a uh, volcano for to power mining. That is, sounds crazy. I mean, so many things that are happening right now sound crazy. And very often new technologies sound crazy at first. And they, you know, sound like they're games or toys. They sound absurd. And then slowly they evolve and come into their own and then begin to be applied the way we're seeing with NFTs right now, which still sounds like a game, but it's real. Um, this idea of a volcano uh, 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 powering uh, Bitcoin mining, while it sounds crazy, they're working on it. And there will be other breakthroughs like that. And there will be other um, large projects, and there are already uh going on even in Ch e even in china where they've where, where they're really cracking down um and i think that has more to do with control um control of the money system uh than it does necessarily uh energy usage which they're able to use as a uh as a a, a way you know a thing to blame um but uh i think you i think it's going to spur innovation that's a, a yeah. simple way to put what I just said. But the, 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 the volcano is just a fascinating recent example that you're seeing play out right now. Yeah, that is fascinating. Justin, what about your thoughts? We, how do we reconcile the sort of like massive levels of energy use and what that looks like in the future? Yeah, I think there's, there's two trends going on. One, you have just the general renewable energy trends, which um, will be applied to um, you know, the mining of crypto, over time, and, and I think most blockchains are moving away from proof of work, um, which is what um, really, really eats up a lot of the, mem um, the the energy use. So Ethereum's moving to proof of stake. Uh, I don't think Bitcoin will ever move away from proof of work, um, but as renewables come in, um, you know, more and more renewables come in, it, you know, it'll be less, you know, leave less of a carbon footprint. Um, but I mean, and things change, right? Like if you look. 20 years ago, the dollar was heavily tied, tied to the oil market. It's less so now, and it will be less so 10 years from now. Um, I think just like everything online, um, and you know, you, because you can track it and because you can see it and because it can be calculated so easily, um, you know, it's easy to identify it as a problem. You know, things like Craigslist, um, you know, ads like that used to be stuff that happened, you know very like, you know, underneath, you know, underground. And now, you know, there's listings on Craigslist that people get upset about and, you know, either they change it or they don't, but, you know, it wasn't because of Craigslist. It was, you know, that, you know, that was a mirror into what we do. And I think very much crypto is a mirror into how our economy functions. Yeah. So before we move into, cause I'm going to ask you some very specific questions on NFTs. Cause I know where there's going to be lots of questions about this, but before I move into that, um, Let's examine a little bit more use cases on the intersection of how a lot of investors now are don't want to just invest for a rate of return, but they want their dollar to be 
um, associated with whatever, whether it's ESG values or whatever values that they feel that they want to express with those dollars, right? Whatever um, trends that they want to support with those dollars. How do you see this technology powering that? That's a great question. Um, in the NFT space, I think you're seeing that happen a lot um, in that um, a lot of NFTs, you know, a lot of projects are doing, you know, NFTs is kind of like a, you know, somewhat of like a decentralized Kickstarter. So, um, you know, you'll they'll commission some art or just kind of create something that represents what they believe in, um, what they're trying to do. And, you know, people will buy it because they want to support that cause. Um, and I, and I see a lot of that happening in the future, whether it be, you know, collaborations between artists and causes, um, and then that going into say like, um, a DAO treasury and a DAO is basically the concept of an organization on the blockchain it stands for a decentralized autonomous organization. So, you know, it's basically a bunch of people around, um, a treasury that holds, you know, potentially all sorts of assets, you know, whether it be stable coins or, um, you know, Ethereum or even their own token, um, or, or maybe nothing really, it could hold nothing. Um, and they, they vote on what to do and, you know, they go do it, um, decentralized. So I think you're going to start to see that happen where you're going to have these foundations and these organizations on the blockchain, you're going to have, whether it be art or smart contracts that feed off, um, some money to these organizations that incentivize you to use this contract or this protocol over that protocol. Um, you'll start to see that get embedded in, into the system itself. Got it. No, another component to that is political and really also uh, political slash control. So people want to have control over their own uh, data, over their own identity, privacy. And I think that... Uh, uh, some of these technologies are an entree into us moving away from corporations uh, and governments having so much control over our data and identity and us having more control over that. So I think that's, that's something you're going to see too. It's a little bit loaded. I'm not going to go any deeper there, but I think there's also a political component to it as well. Understood. Understood. So now let's shift into a little bit of the specifics. So um, just to make this a little more, more real for folks, do you own any NFTs, Justin or Phil? I, I do. You do. Tell, tell us about one that you, if you're, if you're you know, at liberty to do so, like why, what was your head? Where were you at? Why did you do it? What is it? Sure. Um, my, my favorite project and the one where I spent the most time is, um, um, it's a series of, um, it's kind of a platform of projects called art blocks. Um, and they do generative art. So think about, you know, a world where like you were, you know, painting on a canvas. Um, these are people coding up, um, an algorithm that will produce, um, maybe, you know, a hundred or a thousand variations of the same piece of work, but it will all be, you know, variable, but around the same theme. And then you basically, you spend, you know, 0.05 ETH to 0.1 ETH and you mint a random one. And they're kind of like baseball cards in that some are more rare than others. Um, some people value them on aesthetics, but um, what's really interesting is they're all unique and they're not that expensive. I mean, you can mint one for a hundred, two hundred dollars, which is, you know, I, what you'll pay for a print of art, you know, at, you know, any major like kind of furniture store, high-end furniture store to get it framed. Um, so I have a feeling like, and, and the discourse really active. So I, I think it's has this potential to really change the art market. It's the social network component, but like people are discussing the art and I've like, I've liked art, but I've never been into art. And, you know, each week you meet a new artist and it's really, really interesting to see a model that can scale both, you know, on the consumer level where, you know, you could see a kiosk where you can mint this art at a, at a museum or something like that to like, Hey, the art I bought, you know, this year in 20 years, if they make it could be, you know, in a museum somewhere because it, we were, you know, there at that time. So it's, you know, that concept of digital ownership is really interesting. And I, re I really like um, all the NFTs from that platform. I don't. And Justin <laughs> is an expert in this space. I call him all the time and ask him questions about NFTs. And he explains things to me. And 
the reason that I don't own there is that I'm not an expert there. And if I'm making investments, I want to feel, I want to have an advantage. And my biggest advantage is in individual coins where I understand the technology. Um, and I recognize that it is, that there is risk, but I'm willing to take that risk within the context of my larger portfolio, you know, larger portfolio for my goals. And so it's very much a, an individual uh, decision. If you're interested in um, investing in NFTs, I would recommend that you start small and you immerse yourself and really learn about it the way that Justin understands it. Yeah. And, and just to add on to Phil's point, I think with NFTs, um, you know, it's really important because most of them are going to be um, worthless. Um, so, you know, 99% probably will be end up being worthless. So with NFTs, there's really an intrinsic value component to like how you invest there. You know, you want to be able to um, get that intrinsic enjoyment out of um, interacting with it. Um you know, and maybe if you buy 99 out of 100, you know, one might be worth something in the future. And that's, you know, generally the collectibles business in general. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's really the future, you know, for the technology itself as an investment, you know, like really the, the biggest assets are going to be the ones like the, the high end art, things that don't really do much um, because utility. Um, there will be a lot of NFT applications to like a utility or utility applications of NFT technology, but the best things like Bitcoin are just stuff and like gold, right. Or stuff that are useless. Um, and some of this, you know, some of that high end art, you know, just being able to sit somewhere can then stake, um, a DeFi pool or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, one of the things that I think is very important is it doesn't cost any money to be intellectually curious. Like I didn't have to put any capital at risk for me to learn all this information from you guys. And I think that's the other thing that's really important is like, there's a difference between shutting off your brain and versus like not opening up your pocketbook. And I think that the best way, as you said, Phil, before you start investing is know it, right? Get to know it, get comfortable. Um, and even then after that, you might decide I'm not going to partake, but there is no cost in learning. So um, thank you for your time. Uh, for educating me. I tried to keep up with some of the words, uh, but I, I got a lot of pearls out of some of the phrasing that you used, and I know there's questions. So I am going to get out of the way and let the master Brian Overby send some questions your way. So Brian, what are the questions you got? You're muted though, Brian. This is like the... Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad there was somebody else that happened to. I was counting on that, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have some that are basic and some that are advanced overall. So we're going to start off with uh, a very kind of basic question about NFTs. So with that said, we'll, we'll pass this one towards Justin. Uh, what is the purpose or intricate value of owning an NFT even? I'm doing the shoulder shrug here overall. So um, I'll give a good example in the art space. So, um, you know, I personally think when you think about, you know, the art market, you know, you, when you think about digital displays and things like that, owning the NFT is, you know, both ownership of that. Um, I mean, it's the same way of owning anything, right? Like I can copy anything. I could take a picture of the Mona Lisa. I can buy a print of the Mona Lisa, but the Mona Lisa is of value, right? Me owning the actual Mona Lisa would make me very, very wealthy. So when you think about what's the value of owning it, it's owning it, right? Like, yeah, you can own the print, you can own, you know, a picture of it, but you know, the only one person owns the actual piece, um, the actual Mona Lisa. And when you start to get to digital art, you know, like, why would you want to own a video loop, right? Like, you, what does that mean? Like, yeah, you would own that digitally. So, um, you know, owning something is digitally is very new to people because we're used to owning copies on our computer. But and that's what's really disruptive about digital technology is actually owning that thing. It's not a copy of a JPEG that's also on Phil's computer. It is the token itself is um, is owned by you. And that token is associated with that piece of that piece of whatever that media or you know, code or file or whatever. All right. And that was Michael's second second question. I think you kind of covered it. What is a token in, in general? Do you have a little bit more fodder to add to yeah. that, Justin? I mean, the token is just really, you know, it's like a title, right? It says that um, this wallet owns, you know, this 
you know, this thing on the blockchain. Um, you know, it's usually, you know, it's on Ethereum, it's um, a contract, you know, the tokens associated with the smart contract that cert does certain things. Um, so it's just the, the digital representation of whatever it is that, you know, it points to. All right. And so this next question, uh, uh, whoever wants to answer it, uh, it's from Marie. How long do you think it will take until securities are traded on blockchain slash distributed ledger or will they? Anybody want to grab that one? Do you want me to get they that? Are, they already are. Yeah. <laughs> they already are. I think so. That's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, and then oh, cool. next we have, where does the value of that currency get generated? That's the ultimate question, right, guys? Um, yeah, the value of the currency um, is very much like, you know, money is a very nebulous concept. The value of the currency is, you know, the idea that people think it's worth something, right? I think, you know, with something like Ethereum, you know, where you start to have a network effect and you have um, commerce start to take place, you know, the value starts to, um, you know, the, the currency starts to get value, valued by the number of like, um, you know, edges and nodes that come out of that network and the people that use that network for commerce and transactions. Um, something like Bitcoin, where it's a store of value, is enough people that think it's a store of value, similar to gold and similar to any other currency, um, you know, in, in the world, really. All right. So to go along with that question, um, I'll let uh, whoever wants to answer this one, answer this one. This is from Twins Twin. What should we look for when investing in crypto? Are there any specific articles? Should we be looking at the chart? What do we, what do you use to determine when you should buy or sell? Well, the, now you're talking about that speculation part, mm -hmm. the buying and the selling. And if your goal is to invest over a very long period of time, I would say what you want to look at is information as close to the source as you can get. The people building this, the people building these technologies uh, write about it, and uh, the people around them in their communities that uh, Justin described earlier, they write and they make videos about it. And you want to get as close to that as possible. If you are interested in speculation, uh, there's many different ways to speculate. There's multiple time frames. There's uh, the study of price behavior. The only advice I could possibly give you there is to know your risk before you ever put on any uh, position. So in other words, if you are entering something at 10, you have to know before you get in at 10 where you're going to sell and have that worked out, whether it's based on price, whether it's based on how much money you have or whatever. Because if you don't do that, you're not managing risk. You can lose a whole whole lot of money, and that's something that you definitely don't want to do. All right. So this one is perfect for Justin uh, in general. We'll just uh, shorten up the username. Uh, Meta is saying, "How can a normal investor get exposure to NFTs? Where seems like they're all super expensive and rare." Yeah, I mean, I think going along. Um, something like Ethereum gives you exposure to both NFTs and DeFi. Um, there are a couple other um, things out there that are investable. There's a, there's a, um, there's a project called Index Co-op um, that does, they, they're starting to do indices on, you know, on the blockchain. They have a metaverse index, but really just going along Ethereum, you know, will give you the best exposure to NFTs as well as DeFi. And the, and the two will be, you know, I think over time, you know, they're both going to start to merge together as one because one's the finance of another. All right. And I guess this is going to be our last question here. Uh, we have Ashley and Ashley is asking, is Bitcoin considered the new gold? I've heard that. How will crypto perform in rising inflation? Bitcoin is Bitcoin and gold is gold. And they share some uh they share some aspects with each other uh there's a limited supply of both um they're both inert um but they're also different in many ways and what justin said before uh about humans assigning value and there being a demand component 
Uh, that's how we're going to value them. But they're very different uh, in, in more ways than they're similar. And we as humans look for patterns and look for analogies to understand things. And so I think that uh, calling Bitcoin digital gold, yes, it's a store of value similar to the way uh, gold is, but uh, really they're, they're very distinct from each other. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I feel that much smarter today. Thank you very much for uh, breaking down this, what, this very trippy topic for a lot of people. Um, that I think, you know, the more we break it down, I think the more it'll be accessible. So thank you for joining us on that journey. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Lily.